Um, so let's go ahead. Now, sake has been around for a very long time. And what I've done here is to uh, create a timeline. And um, basically, I am not a historian. I am, in fact, a botanist with a specialism in plant pathology. Um, but I think the history of sake, a very brief one, is very, very important. This is not to scale, but to give everybody some idea of the sake timeline. And uh, so much has happened. I could trace it back to as far as 4000 BC up to 2020 today. A lot of information is already available on Google, on Wikipedia, on sake websites, on education websites, and um, it normally starts from about 710 AD to today when um, kanji was available, people could read and write, there were diaries, there were lots of mentions of sake in certain novels, um, whatever, but before the 710 AD, not much is available. So I'm going to start there simply because I don't think anybody has done it before. So roughly as a non-historian, I'm going to wind the clock back all the way to 4000 BC when it was hunter-gatherers. People live, ate, hunted, whatever. Um, they found in about 2000 BC some bits of pottery with uh, residual berries, thought to be possibly elderberries. So even 2000 BC in the Japanese time, people were drinking some sort of fruit wine. And in those days, um, uh, agriculture came in by about 2000 BC, Jomon. Two types of rice were grown. One being the African style of dry farming, and the other wet farming paddy fields. The dry farming bit obviously came from Bali, Java, and the wet farming, the paddy fields came from Thailand, um, into China, Korea, into China, and into Japan. Everything sort of happened sort of south of, the, of Japan, sort of in the um, warmer climes. And um, with agriculture, Rice started becoming the main staple food. Okay, uh, kamikuchi, which means chewing and um, masculating cereal to create a form of alcohol, was already known. We know that in the Western culture, we know that in China, that uh, people did chew acorns, um, wheat, barley, whatever cereal and seeds they could find, and with the uh, saliva created uh, the uh, sort of changed the starch into sugar, which in then, in, 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 in then um, yeast from the air would eat the sugar to create some sort of alcohol. So that was the very, very first um, form of alcohol around. As time went on, 600 BC, Yayoi period, you got people living in straw huts, people living in huts made of rice straw. We also know by then, a form of koji had come in from China. And uh, this koji isn't the koji as we know it today, but initially um, done in bricks, chew. And uh, I don't know whether um, you, 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 you have come across baijiu, which is a Chinese distilled alcohol that uses chew. Similar method of uh, breaking down starch into sugar as, um, as per sake but with a different type of koji. Uh, the koji in, that, in the Chinese form is the rhizopus, rhizopus orize, um, and this they grew on um, a medium of not just rice, but it, it grew on beans and peas and uh, of course rice, wheat, sorghum. It was all mashed up into a brick and left to ferment for months before it was taken out and mixed into a mash uh, to create um, some alcoholic um, liquor. So that was one. The other way that, uh, that was used was that, um, like beer, the Chinese brought in um, malted rice. So malted rice was also used as a form of starch breaking down um, enzymes to create a sugar solution to make um, sake. So 
there you go. So you now got the straw homes, you have got Aspergillus orise, which is a fungus growing on rice ears, no different from any other fungus growing on plants. Now, because they were bringing in all the rice straw to build houses, there was Aspergillus orise in the huts. People were boiling porridge, rice porridge, and uh, eating it and leftover porridge left on tables meant that the spores of the Aspergillus orise would fall into the rice and create the start of what would be, uh, what, uh, would, would be called today as sake. So by, 2000, uh, by 250 AD, there was some sort, some sort of sake already formed. We wind the clock along and um, we come down, we now hit towards 530 AD, where I've put down solid sake. Same thing because the porridge was made, they probably fermented um, sake in the solid form with ri steamed rice grains rather than in a big pot of mash. And it is thought at that time that sake was eaten as a rice ball rather than in a drink. And maybe what they do is to put little uh, sake balls into bowls of which they did find, um, archaeologists have found little bowls where a rice ball possibly would, uh, would fit in there and maybe diluted down with some water and drunk. Um, by 710 AD, Japan had had some influence of the Chinese. Confucianism had come in and the Chinese writing had appeared. And um, at that point in time, sake was mentioned for the first time in the Book of Wei from the Three Kingdoms, where it was stated that Japanese were seen drinking alcohol and uh, dancing and were merry. So that was the first ever uh, mention of sake anywhere uh, in any form of books through the Chinese. 710 AD onwards, you can probably find a lot of information. I'm not going to go too much into it. That is where we see sake as true sake, properly brewed, some form of pressing to get rid of the solids and uh, drunk as a drink. Uh, 1192, temples and shrines started producing sakes because sake was used purely for religious region, uh, reasons. And um, with the production of sake only in temples, normal people decided that they wanted to drink sake and doboroku, which is a homemade sake, came about. And uh, people were starting to brew sake at home. Wind the clock forward, you then come to sort of the early 1600s where the real experimentation of sake began, the Edo period, where Japan opened its doors. You had the Portuguese coming in, bringing in Christianity, and in doing so, so brought in the distillation process. We know that distillation process uh, probably started off in the 13th century by the Arabs, who distilled flower solutions to create um, perfumes rather than for drinking. Um, but same method, uh, sort of, sort of uh, fermented um, alcohol was then distilled and early 1600s saw the beginnings of shochu and what we call imozake. Shochu came in via the south of Japan through uh, Okinawa and uh, rice was brought in from Thailand and um, our mori was uh, distilled down south and slowly um, uh, distillation came out. There was uh, one recorded um, in, uh, thing that said that imo sake, which is shochu, was sold in a market in Kyoto. Edo period also saw um, the use of the Kimoto method of making sake, and that is where um, a paste of rice, koji, and yeast were bashed for 14 days to create a paste that hopefully what they thought would create a good pot of yeast for the actual brewing of sake. 
um, pasteurization also uh, was found around the Edo period. They found that by pasteurizing sake, it meant that uh, they could kill off lots of bacteria. The sandan jikomi, which we'll talk about a bit later, the three, the three um, stage building up of a sake mesh was invented around the Edo period. By 1868, the start of the Meiji restoration, uh, the Japanese government decided to open up sake brewing. So anybody with the know-how and some money could set up a brewery and brew their own sake. Uh, however, the Japanese government also realized that they could make a lot of money by heavy taxation on sake. And within a few years, the number, the number of sake breweries actually dwindled down to about, about 8,000. Today, there are only 1,200 sake breweries left in Japan. In the uh, Meiji period, kamakuchi was banned. The chewing of grains was banned in 1898, as late as 1898. So people were still chewing and spitting and using saliva to make uh, a sort of sake. The Yamahai method, another method for uh, building up a sake production, was uh, invented and the Yamahai method just basically was a Kimoto method of making a sake starter without the padding, the 14 days of padding. For the, um, so the NRIB, NRIB stands for the National Research Institute of Brewing uh, in Japan and a couple of years later the BSJ which is the Brewing Society of Japan. Both these two institutions are very important. They were um, institutions that um, did research that isolated yeast and uh, they controlled how to make good sakes in the sense that uh, they ensured that good quality of yeast and uh, methods and um, everything was happening in Japan. 1907 saw the first Japanese uh, competition for sake, which still holds today. Um, 1912 to 1945 was very interesting times for Japan. It was when uh, the wars, the First and Second World War happened and um, basically rice was the big issue. The Japanese government persuaded people to use rice for making sake. The country was already poor, it had lost the war, and all rice that was grown was destined for the stomach. And in doing so, it changed the sake world again. And, um, and what happened there was because of the lack of rice, not much alcohol could be made using rice alone. So the government allowed alcohol some form of alcohol to be added to sake to, to, to bump up the, the alcohol level. Uh, the kind of alcohol that was brought in was obviously from Brazil, good friends of um, Japan. So mainly sugarcane alcohol added and um, that carried on. 1945, it continued and because it had uh, alcohol had been added to sake for so long, it, um, people's palates liked the taste of alcohol, so that remained. From 1945 onwards, uh, we see the modern style of sake. We um, also see sakes being brewed overseas because through the wars, a lot of Japanese emigrated to places like um, Brazil and uh, um, uh, California. So the first uh, sake breweries outside of Japan were in Brazil, California, Hawaii. Um, by 2000, other countries started uh, um, brewing al uh, al uh, sakes, and um, now we have sake brewed in the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. We even have uh, breweries in Europe, in Italy, in France, and a very good one in Spain. And even in wonderful UK, we have got two very good sake breweries, one in Cambridgeshire and one here down in London. 2016, last bit of information, GI for sake was invented as in geographical indication. The first GI for sake uh, uh, was in Yamagata with uh, Dewa Sansan rice. 
okay, so that is history. I know it's very short, very abridged, and I've raced through it. There's so much more to tell you, but we've got to press on. Next slide, please, Leona. Okay, now let's look at sake. What is sake? Sake is an alcoholic drink, very popular in Japan. Uh, let me just check my notes to make sure that everything's okay. Um, it is less acidic, more alcoholic, cleaner, and often sweeter than wine and beer. It can be crystal clear, it can be cloudy, it can be murky, sparkling, or a combination of all of the above. Sometimes, as I said, alcohol can be added to it. And in most cases, it's got lactic acid. The lactic acid doesn't really give flavor to alcohol or to the sake, but it just keeps all the bad bugs at bay. It kills off all the, uh, the bacteria and other nasties that can otherwise spoil sake. Sake is sometimes referred to as Nihon Shu. Nihon meaning Japan, Shu meaning sake or alcohol. And um, now more recently the word Seishu is used and this just means clear alcohol and the Japanese government would very much like the word seishu to be used on sake brewed outside of Japan. The interesting thing about sake is that it's made from only four basic ingredients, rice, water, koji, and yeast. It's a very complex fermentation method. Uh, next slide, uh, Leona, please. Okay, now let's look at sake versus wine and beer. We all know what how wine is made, but this is a, a, a little diagram drawn just to show you uh, the differences. So I've got wine, grapes, you press the grapes, you get the juice, the grape juice has already got your sugar in it, so in comes the ambient yeast and you get wine. In beer, you've got your barley, you tend to germinate it, you malt it, Basically, by germinating it, your little shoot that's growing has got lots of enzymes that turn the starch in the um, sort of soaked barley grain uh, into sugar for itself to grow. It also has a protease enzyme that breaks down the um, proteins and uh, the other goodies to turn it into amino acids. And uh, that is what allows for the... Um, uh, the growing of the plant. So basically it's germinated, it's roasted to kill off uh, the actual um, little shoot. It's then called malt. The malt has already got the enzymes. They then heat it up to create the mesh and the enzymes, uh, the amylase and the protease breaks down your leftover starch, turns it into wort and in the wort, uh, which is a big big huge tank of gooey porridge, yeast is then put in there and it turns into beer. Now with sake, just look at the diagram, it's a lot more complicated. You've got steam rice. You then have to create a shubo, which is the mother of sake, which is your little pot of yeast uh, that is then thrown into a bigger pot of your mash and uh, sake is formed. Now the the way it happens is what we call the multiple parallel fermentation where both the yeast and the koji creating the enzymes happen at the same time. So everything is happening. You've got your koji creating amylase and enzymes turning the starch into sugar and at the same time the yeast is taking up the sugar and converting it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. And that process keeps continuing till you get sake. On the right, I have got a tiny little table that just gives you some idea of the differences. And as you can see, the alcohol um, percentage in sake is higher than beer and white wine. You can also see the sweetness um, where sake is a lot sweeter than beer and white wine. Umami, which is um, a measure of the amount of nitrogen and um, your gl glutamic uh, acids, Plenty in sake, very little in beer, and almost nothing in white wine. pH-wise, you can see sake has got a higher pH. It's, more, it's not alkaline, but it's more alkaline that, than white wine is. And that, for that reason, putting sulfur dioxide into sake doesn't work. Sulfur dioxide will not kill off your germs and your, and your, and your bugs that, uh, that, that 
it does in white wine. So there are no sulfites in sake. And uh, your malic acid and succinic acid, don't worry too much about it. Next slide, please, uh, Leona. Now, very quickly, I am giving you a sort of examples of some types of sake that you might see or um, get to try when you're in Japan. Most of these sakes don't even exist in the UK. Um, lots of Japanese words, and that's the problem with sakes. Uh, there's, most of it is written in Japanese, though it's getting better. I was involved in a project over the summer creating a massive database, and uh, very soon, um, it will be available and this whole sort of mystical Japanese world will become a lot more clear. And as you can see, there's loads of different sakes. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but this, the ones that uh, we drink today are Nigori sake, cloudy, uh, undiluted sake, genshu, um, koshu, which is old age sake, um, taru sake, which I'm sure a lot of you have tasted is sake, uh, uh, from the cedar cas and uh, haposhu sparkling sake. So it's there and uh, there are lots of other sakes to be found. Next slide. Okay, ingredients of sake. As I mentioned, there are only four main ingredients of sake. Number one, rice. What we have to know here is that only 5% of rice grown in Japan is destined for sake. There are 120 sake designated rice. They're all sort of non-glutinous rice. Glutinous rice has got far too much uh, myelopectin, which is a more complicated, more uh, a bigger molecule of sugar that cannot be um, broken down any further and keeps the alcohol a bit too sweet. And um, glutinous rice is actually used for making mirin, which we all know, um, and use for cooking. There are five main um, varieties of rice that is used. Yamada Nishiki and Gohyaku Mangoku. These are the two most popular and about 60% of sake rice grown in Japan are from both these two uh, varieties. The others are Miyama Nishiki, Dewa San San, which is the rice I mentioned that uh, gained the first GI for sake, and of course Omachi, which is the grandfather of all sake rice. Um, most of the sake rice have got some DNA from the original Omachi. Um, you can use table rice to make sake. Now, sake rice is not just sake rice. This is Japan. Everything is so controlled. Sake rice has got to be grown, graded, and then there's a wide price range depending on the grade you buy. After that, the rice has to be polished. Sake classification is based on the polish of rice, which we will see shortly. The rice grains cannot be used for sake till it's cooked. So the rice grains then have to be washed. They've got to be soaked. They've, well, before they're washed, they've got to be milled. They've got to be uh, washed, soaked, and then steamed. And from steaming, you then get sake. Nice little picture there, which um, I think I managed to persuade the um, American School of Sake to let me use is uh, electron microscope of the rice. You can see these are the real sort of uh, sake designated rice with the starch core. That is called the shimpaku. That little blob in the middle of the rice grain is just full of starch. And that's the difference between sake rice and table rice. In table rice, starch is sort of um, right through the grain. Whereas in sake rice, which is uh, bigger than table rice, you get that sort of um, structure. And I show you some, I'm showing you some milling, not very clear, I'm very sorry. Come on the course and you will actually see uh, proper samples in real life. And um, just to show you the difference between a little rice grain that hasn't been milled, a little brown rice grain compared to a polished rice grain of, I'm guessing they're possibly about maybe 8% of the original size of the rice. Second ingredient in sake is water. 
very, very important. Water affects the taste and aromatic profiles, as you can imagine. Uh, the koji needs uh, water to grow and that depends on how much minerals it has in it. Um, and then uh, uh, Japanese water is very clean and soft, so great for making sake. Third ingredient is koji, Aspergillus orize, critical ingredient as mentioned. And um, lastly, yeast. Now these yeasts, I'm just going to at this point say there are different types of yeast. There are some that are better for fermenters, some that give better profile of uh, aromas. There's low form of foaming yeast, which is important because you can then brew a lot more yeast in the same size tank. And you've got a modern style yeast called 1801, which is blended and a lot of new modern sakes use that particular yeast. Next slide. Okay, sake production. Very, very complicated, as I said. You start off with uh, the shubo, which is almost like the leven in making sourdough bread. You create this little pot that grows your yeast. Because yeast is so important and so specialized in Japan, you can only buy a small vial. And from that small vial, you have got to grow it to a good enough number to throw into your big mash, the moromi. So, You've got your shubo, it takes 14 days to grow your yeast, it goes into the main mesh, which takes three, four days to build up, and then it takes between two weeks to six weeks, depending on how you want to brew your sake. The choice is up to the toji, the sake, chief sake brewer, and uh, it's up to him what kind of sake you want to make. And just before you press, you can then add alcohol, as we said. So alcohol can be added. It doesn't have to be. Again, choice of the toji. The mash then has to be pressed. If sake is not pressed, it cannot be called sake. That is very, very important. And by the way, the addition of lactic acid is not seen as an ingredient. That is part of the water um, uh, recipe. And uh, making sake technically is like 130 parts of water to 80 parts of rice to 20 parts of koji, right? So you press the sake, you then have choice. Do you want to dilute the sake? Do you not? Then after your, your, your dilution or non-dilution, sake has got to go through some sort of filtration to get rid of the dead uh, yeast cells, bits of koji filament done by sedimentation, by protein filing, or by charcoal filing, or all three. After filtering the sake, you then again can decide pasteurization, non-pasteurization. If it's not pasteurized, your sake is ready, it gets sent out, and it's drunk very fresh. If you're going to pasteurize it, there are many forms of pasteurization by bulk pasteurization, by bottle pasteurization. Do you pasteurize it once? Do you pasteurize it twice? And then it is stored. Again, different choices of storage, big tanks in bottles. Do you age it? Do you not age it? So that's your sake production. Now in every production method, there are byproducts. Unlike the wine world and the beer world where there's just a big, big bulk of um, leftovers, the Japanese are very, very careful. Everything is used. The best form of, um, uh, of uh, oh, what my daughter is in at the moment, <laughs> um, um, I can't think of the word, but basically everything is used, nothing is wasted. Kasu, which is sake lees, is uh, used today to make kasu ice cream, kasu cheesecake. Um, it is used for um, pickling food. It is also used as a, um, a soup, um, used in soup instead of miso. It is used for uh, marinating, all sorts of uses. Nuka, rice bread. Again, the rice bread is not wasted. Um, you can turn it into a mixture for pickling veg. Rice flour, all that mill flour is not wasted. It goes into making rice crackers, rice cakes, and uh, uh, in Niigata, you can actually buy big, big packets of rice cake made from sake flour. 
and koji lastly you've made a whole load of koji for um, fermentation but that could be left over koji again is not wasted it goes into making miso and soy sauce as well as um, mixed with some salt water and turned into a meat tenderizer. Next slide please, uh, Leona. Categories of sake. I think all of us know there are these sake uh, categories. There's a lot of information already out on the internet with lots of different diagrams. For me, this diagram works and um, sakes are categorized according to the degree which the rice has been polished and whether alcohol has been added or not. So as you can see on the left hand side alcohol added and uh, on the top shows you the polish rates of the rice grain and into what category the sakes go into. So I don't like using the word basic but futsushu is what you call basic. It's what I call everyday drinking. It's your van de table. It's very delicious. And if anybody says it's cheap and cheerful, they could be terribly wrong. In 2017, the trophy winner of the IWC sake was a uh, futsushu made with a 70% uh, polish. And it is so delicious. Uh, Watanabe uh, Shuzo is the um, brewery that makes it. It's called Brewer's Perfection. And you can still get it today at about, I reckon, under 20 pounds a bottle, 15, 15 pounds a bottle. So that's a futsu. Now notice I've put Junmai sort of in both because in today's world, a lot of people like to be healthy. Junmai basically means pure rice. So a lot of people actually believe that pure rice sake is healthy for you. Other than not having a drop of alcohol put in and possibly diluted back, that's uh, that's that's their prerogative. So anything that hasn't had alcohol added to it is called junmai. For a better sake, you get your junmai ginjo, and then for an even better sake with 50% or less of the rice grain left during fermentation, it's called junmai dai ginjo. Conversely, with alcohol added, you have got honjozo, ginjo, and dai ginjo. Sometimes you see the word tokobetsu. Tokubetsu just means special. And what do they mean by special? It's normally put on Honjozo's Junmai's. It's not seen in Junmai Ginjo's, Ginjo's, Dai Ginjo's, or Junmai Dai Ginjo because they're already special in itself. And um, basically, when you have Tokubetsu written in front, it just means that maybe they've put in an additional step in the, in the um, production. Maybe they've used a different ingredient. Maybe they've polished the rice higher than what it should be. So you might find a tokubetsu honjozo with a polish rate of say, um, I don't know, uh, uh, 60, you know, um, 68 or you know something 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 like that uh, or 60, which technically it is a ginjo but because it's a hon they feel it's a honjozo with, an, with a better polishing rate, it becomes a tokubetsu honjozo. On the right, I'm show, uh, I show this tasting profile wheel, the sake tasting wheel. I think it's very clever. It's available on the website. You can find it. It's, uh, it gives you all the flavors on the outer um, ring, followed by sort of um, the odor and taste um, um, terms. Very, very clever. And uh, by using that, you can basically work out what uh, kind of sakes you like. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Right. Sake culture in Japan. We know that Japan is very, very, very special. They, they, they are gentle people. They don't buy a bottle of sake, sit in a pub and drink the whole lot in one gulp. You certainly don't drink sake from big, huge glasses. I see Juliet smiling there. Um, sake is drunk because it expresses the beauty, the nature and the spirit of Japanese culture and seasons. You will see people in parks in the spring with their picnic baskets with a bottle of sake underneath the uh, cherry blossom trees enjoying um, 
the just being there okay in the autumn you tend to use chrysanthemum and chrysanthemum petals to flavor your sake and of course you could be sitting in your lovely hot tub in the winter snowflakes falling on you and drinking your little glass of warm sake uh, sake serving can be very tricky. This is because it is very, very, very rude to pour your own sake. You always have friends pouring sake for you, as you can see, uh, the lady pouring. And uh, secondly, you always pour sake to the brim of the cup. It has to be overflowing to show your uh, hospitality. Uh, hospitality. So a lot of places would put a glass in a masu, the little square box, to allow the overflow of sake. Um, and of course, uh, sake is drunk in groups where you pour for each other, you're happy. All I can say is drink with good friends who look after you and pour your sake into your glass for you, keeping it full at all times. The picture on the right there, just very quickly, is to show you the sake vending machine at the Niigata train station. And uh, if you go in there, you get your little choco on the left-hand side with five tokens for what used to be 500 yen. And uh, you put your little token in, there's a little spout, put your cup in there and you get a little sample of sake. There are 93 different sakes on offer at any one time. Then we talk about drinking sake at different temperatures. Again, I've put a little uh, table there for anybody who's interested and uh, put the different temperatures in, uh, in five degree uh, sections and uh, what they mean. So from zero degrees frozen, it goes right up to uh, very warm, extremely hot at uh, Tobiko Kan. And finally, next slide. Uh, I thought I'd throw this in. Now, in the West, we look at volumes of increments of 10. In Japan, it's different. It's in increments of 18. So you've got one shaku, 18 mil, which is a little glass. Uh, and you can see on the left-hand side, the little to uh, chocos. They're all different sizes, different styles, glass, pottery, porcelain, um, whatever you want, lacquer, wood, you pick one and you use that for the rest of the evening. Then you go on to Ichigo, go, um, that is 180 mils, and a cedar masu, masu is your little square box, um, derived from the days where rice was always measured in one of these masus, and it has continued over the generations. You bought your rice in little cups uh, of 180 mils. The modern bottle is uh, yongo, yongo bin, four go bottles, bin bottle, 720 mils. Very, very strange to us, but uh, it's 720 mil. And then isho bin, if you go to any restaurant, any izakaya in Japan, and even here, um, it's 1.8 mils, um, 1.8 liters, sorry, 1,800 mils. And then ito, which is 18 litres, is the size of a big cedar barrel. I don't have a big cedar barrel, but just to show you, those are the barrels. The ito bins, are you, uh, ito uh, taru, are used for celebrations. You have, if you're lucky enough, you've probably gone to a um, kagami biraki, uh, whereby uh, at a wedding or at a big office party, they crack open a big barrel of sake. Kagami biraki meaning to break the mirror. And a koku, one point, uh, 180 litres is your stainless steel tank, the measure of a big um, uh, stainless steel uh, mesh fermenting tank. Next and final slide. We look at food, glorious food. Now, I understand there are a number of sommeliers and on-trade uh, staff there on today's, in today's lecture. What I want to say is, like wine, sake matches with everything. There will be a bottle of sake that will match any kind of food, okay, from the crazy, if you look in front of you in the white platter, that is a monkfish foie gras, ankimo, and it's steamed monkfish liver. 
you will find a nice junmai. And it doesn't have to be a junmai daiginjo, a junmai that would uh, match that kind of food. You've got oysters, you have got edamame that you always have in izakayas as your little hors d'oeuvre starter. You can basically match all kinds of food. A steak with a beautiful, um, good quality honjozo, wagyu beef, uh, if it's cooked richly, again, you know, a junmai would work. On the left there are crispy fried um, eel bones, very, very umami filled, so something like a junmai. Above that is your smoked ibu, uh, ibura, iburi kako, which is a smoked daikon that has been stuffed with cream cheese. A lovely lactic junmai would go. Um, your uh, what you call it, um, sashimi, uh, very clean, very, very delicate jumai daiginjo, your tofu. Now that tofu there has got shirako. What is shirako, you ask me? Shirako are the sperm duct of the, <laughs> steamed sperm duct of the codfish. Okay, and that goes very, very well with um, uh, very lactic uh, junmai. Lamb, fantastic with a futsu. There's nothing wrong with futsushus. Some futsushus, futsushus are fantastic. Karage, chicken, deep fried uh, chicken thighs, that goes fantastically well. Again, with a junmai, with a futsushu, it doesn't matter. Ayu fish straight from the river, roasted on hot charcoals. A nice daiginjo would go well. Um, and then I put there kiritampo. Kiritampo is this uh, nabe style, pot style of a stew that is from the sort of wilds of Akita. Yep. And uh, the wild, uh, they've got like free range, really tough wild chicken up there, which is sort of hunted, chopped up. And believe you me, they use every part of the chicken in that. All right. So, and I mean it. Um, and uh, that with leeks and mushrooms is boiled with a pot uh, with a bottle of sake that goes really well with um, probably I would say a daiginjo because um, it needs a bit more alcohol but it's a very clean dish it's eaten with roasted rice where they sort of uh, take sticks twigs and they pro compress rice on the stick and put it over the fire to bake so it's got sort of like roasted rice and hamburger yeah why not have it with a nice junmai um, and uh, anything everything if you can match a food a platter of food with wine I promise you you can match that same platter with a sake and on that note everybody come pie Drink lots of sake. It's World Sake Day on the 1st of October. Get out there. Lots of sake um, distributors and retailers are giving fantastic discounts for the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Sorry, I rushed. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. I, I don't know if uh, has uh, anyone, uh, everyone has uh, your lunch yet. I certainly feel very hungry after all that pictures. And uh, so, uh, yes, I got. I think we have a couple of questions. Then before we go into the question, I think I hope everyone has learned as much as I've done, and um, because there's so much to learn. And uh, just to mention that Maria is uh, actually. Um, writing a book about sake as well and i heard that it will be published sometime between end of october to november so watch the space okay and i think it's an ebook as well so it's going to be yes. quite easy to uh to, to purchase and all that okay it will be cheap it will be cheap <laughs> okay so uh, just very quickly i'm conscious about the time but thank you everyone for staying up uh, still with us so the couple of questions here that uh one from robin uh when did sake exports begin ah oh, depends what you mean by exports to the uk or you know worldwide there's always been a trickle of sakes coming from japan way back to the um as far as I remember it, and I'm old, um, in the 70s, you got sakes, but they were not very good qualities. The one thing I haven't mentioned is storage of sakes. Sakes cannot be stored for long. Buy them, drink them within two years. So in the early days, very oxidized um, 
very, very expensive sakes did come out of Japan and um, certainly they were exported to the US since the 1950s. Brazil, they were actually trickling into Brazil sort of around the 90s, uh, sort of post-war. But in the UK, I can remember drinking sake for at least 30 years. So sake has been around for around then. Okay. There's another question you, you just mentioned about, you know, sake can be kept for about probably a couple of years. What about open sake? Is it like why, since there are no preservative that you mentioned, no so far, it's, so how long after we open the bottle can we keep the sake and how do we keep it? Okay. If you open a bottle of sake, firstly, don't open big, big bottles, okay? If there are a few of you, either buy them in smaller quantities. You can get them in 300s, you can get them in 180s, you can get them in cup sakes. But a bottle of sake, I wouldn't drink after about a week. And if you really have to, start warming it up. The way to keep your sake going is to open it, put it straight away in the fridge, drink it for about a few days, and then once it starts getting a bit oxidized, feel free to heat it up a bit. By heating it up, it freshens it and it allows the alcohol to sort of sort of evaporate and you still get some of the good flavors. Okay, another question about preservatives as well. I mean, lots of people are interested in that. So you say there's no sulfides in sake, then how do producer use to preserve, uh, you know, sake? Lactic acid. Remember I mentioned lactic acid? Now because uh, sake, as we saw, um, has a pH that is sort of higher, it's more alkali. So lactic acid is the acid used to knock off all the bad bacteria. Great, thank you. Last question, uh, some people ask about the, uh, the courses. So there are, I know there are a few kind of sake courses available in the market. So like WSET, I, I certainly know there are a few others. So in your opinion, so what are the difference between those courses? Okay, wearing my council member on uh, the Association of Wine Educators where I cannot recommend any particular course because um, it is wrong. There are a few different suppliers. Um, in the UK, you have got the, I think, Sake Sommelier Association, it's called, it's a very short course, half a day, very, very basic, but if it's something you just want to learn a little bit about, cheaper, you've got that. Then you've got your Sake Kikishi, which is the Japanese version of the Sake Sommelier um, Association. There are, uh, it's a five day course and it runs through more of how to serve sakes and um, very, very good course. And it's also taught in this country. And then of course you have got a WSET and um, there are two courses. One is the level one, a more basic for the um, on trade. It's plenty, um, it's quite intensive and there is an exam. And if you want to further your knowledge to become a toji or a sake brewer, you can take the level three, which really goes deep into the production of sake, how to serve, what you use, what are the different styles of making sake. Um, so those are available in the UK. You have also got Sake School of America who've got their own sake courses. You have got uh, the JSS, the Japanese Sake and Shochu Makers Association course. They run that once a year. They're very, very selective. I think uh, no more than about 10 to 15 people can go on that course. It's a one week um, and you stay there. You go to Japan, Tokyo, you stay there and it's very, very intensive and that's a good course. And of course, you've got John Gortner who has been... Um, uh, um, presenting his courses for a very, very long time. He's very good. He doesn't teach in the UK, but I understand he's got an online course right now. Uh, what else? There's Michael Tremblay in the US. He's got a very, very advanced course. Uh, it looks more at the regionality of sakes, and there's a very tough exam that follows it. And lastly, there is the, the, the big sake diploma course in Japan where very few people pass. <laughs> like the master of wine, right? Yeah, it's like the master of wine. A lot of people take it and very few people pass it.
All right. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. I don't think there's any other questions, but uh, we will, I'll be sending out an email. The session has been recorded. If you want to catch up or you want to see clearly of the slides, you'll be able to uh, have a look of the reply. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you especially for Murray. And it's a wonderful session with lots of information. So thank you all very much. Have a lovely afternoon or morning whenever you are. Okay. Bye, everyone. thank you. Bye, thank you. Sorry I rushed it, but I wanted to get as much in. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.